Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our webinar Wednesday in recognition of uh, Mental Health Awareness Month. Uh, today's webinar is about mental health and cancer. Just as a reminder, please make sure that you stay muted throughout the presentation. Um, we are streaming this live to Facebook and uh, we are recording it to put on our YouTube channel afterward. Um, if you have any questions throughout today's webinar, um, you can use the chat box feature. Um, if we have time at the end, you can just unmute yourself and ask our presenter any questions directly. Uh, for those of you who are joining us on Facebook Live, please use the comments feature on Facebook to ask any questions and we'll be monitor monitoring that to make sure that we address them. Our Webinar Wednesday series is brought to you by the University of Chicago Comprehensive Cancer Center Office of Community Engagement and Cancer Health Equity. We are the community engagement arm of the Cancer Research Center at the University of Chicago. Um, and one of our goals is to bring cancer related um, educational topics to the um, University of Chicago and broader community. Um, my name is Aliyah Poulos and I am an education outreach specialist in this office. I'm joined today uh, by my colleague, Erica Rodriguez, who's our Latinx outreach specialist. Um, if if you have any, <clears throat> excuse me, for those of you who are on Zoom, if you have any questions um, or comments that you want to ask to one of us directly, um, you can find our names on the Zoom chat, Aaliyah or Erica. Um, and thank you again for joining us today. So um, as I mentioned, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, it's been observed in the United States since 1949. And the 2021 theme is You Are Not Alone. Um, these graphics here are from the uh, National Alliance for um, National Alliance for Mental Health. And so it just sort of um, illustrates the fact that mental health is something that is, of course, a lot of us know, um, but it is something that's really prevalent um, in the United States and worldwide, of course, exacerbated by the coronavirus pandemic. Um, and so it's really important that we uh, bring awareness to, um, to mental health. And as it relates to cancer, we have a really uh, fabulous speaker today. Uh, Dr. Faye Hubaki is a uh, clinical health psychologist and ethicist at the University of Chicago Medicine um, Cancer Center. She is our, our in-house expert and our go-to uh, person when we um, need some uh, great information about mental health and cancer. So we are so excited to welcome her here today. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen so that Dr. Hubaki can go ahead and share hers. Thank you again for joining us today, Dr. Hubaki. Oh, thank you, Leah. Hi, everybody. It's so great to be with you today. I hope you're having a wonderful day. All Chicagoans, we're really excited that the sun is out. So let's see if we, um, can you see that? With, is that all right? Yes, yes, I can okay. see that, okay. Okay, great, all right. So um, it's so so lovely to be with you. Um, I've been at UC for many, many years, actually started out as a research assistant and came back after my training. So I'm sure many of us have encountered one another in the hallways and that, and um, so important to talk about mental health um, and cancer to talk about what our patients are going through, but also what our colleagues are going through, especially now with the COVID-19 crisis and, and a lot of folks experiencing burnout. So there's gonna be, uh, some of the slides are kind of data heavy and, and all that, but I just wanted to make sure that you you all had the information so that if you needed to go back to it, they, that you had it. So honor, honor and pleasure to be with, with all of you today. Thank you so much. So we'll talk about, Ali already uh, gave a great um, introduction to Mental Health Awareness Month. We'll just briefly touch on that and provide a little update on cancer statistics for 2021 um, and what are some of the behavioral and risk factors that many of you know, but just to kind of remind of ourselves and see how things change, believe it or not, when I was doing some of the literature, it was, it was interesting to see the, the change in numbers um, and that, uh, and to provide an understanding of what's psycho-oncology. So I'm a psychologist and my training is in cancer care of patients, caregivers, as well as staff and clinicians, and to provide um, education, um, clinical care, and, re and, and research. We do a lot of research. Um, and talk about the psychosocial impact of cancer, what's called distress, and what does that mean for survivors, end-of-life care for both the patient and the caregiver. Um, talk about some psychosocial interventions that probably many of you are familiar with or have heard or seen. And uh, again, talk about health professional well-being to kind of end it, end it up there with some resources. So it is, it is mental health 
um, Awareness Month and, and as a mental health uh, uh, advocate, so delighted that we have this month that we can really bring awareness to try to end the stigma associated with mental health. Um, again, there is still a great deal of stigma, but I think this type of conversation and awareness and advocacy really helps us to address that. So, so honored um, to be a part of it and to talk to you about it. Um, Hilly already talked about about how it, it started in 1949 um, by the Mental Health America organization, which at the, that time was known as the National Association for Health. And each year in March, there's always a toolkit of materials to guide and prepare for outreach um, and its affiliates and other organizations always conduct a, a number of activities. Um, the theme uh, follows the tools to thrive. So each year they have a package of themes, practical, practical tools that anyone can use, whether it's our patients, whether it's ourselves, just to improve our mental health and, and resi resiliency. Um, so there's the, the link there if you'd like additional information on that. And just to tell us a little bit about the data for the general um, U.S. population, nearly one in five Americans will have a diagnosable mental health condition in any given year. And 46% of Americans will meet some type of criteria for a diagnosable mental mental health conditions sometime in their lifetime. Half of those conditions will be by the age of 14. So recognizing that there is a, a genetic predisposition, sometimes life stressors, other things um, can um, be associated with, the, with mental health issues. Um, and the number of U.S. adults with mental illness is 44 million. So that's 18% of the population might say, gosh, that's not a, that's not a lot. But that's actually quite a bit. And the lifetime prevalence of any anxiety disorder is 31.6%. Anxiety disorders themselves tend to be the most common mental health illnesses and, um, in, in the United States. And an estimated 2.5 of U.S. adults experience bipolar disorder sometime in their lives. Um, depression, substance abuse, post-traumatic um, stress, schizophrenia, uh, suicidal uh, thoughts and ideation, and other mental um, health uh, disorders are also um, included in this. But anxiety tends to be the greatest. And, and now with the COVID-19 pandemic, there are predictions that we're really worried about substance abuse, depression, and anxiety. And how is that going to affect our patients, our colleagues in, in the long term? And we'll, we'll talk about uh, briefly about that. So cancer statistics, so that's the general mental health population. So how does that impact cancer? What, what are the statistics for 2021? Because we've been so involved with COVID. Um, recognizing the fact that there's 18 million cancer survivors in 2020, that was the last stat, and that's about 30% more than 2010. And in 2030, they're predicting, the American Cancer Society is predicting there's going to be 32 million cancer survivors that we're going to be taking care of. So that's really important. Um, it's approximately 1.9 million and over 600,000 uh, uh, new cases is 1.9 million over 600 um, uh, cancer deaths are predicted. And after significant increases in 20th century, the cancer death rate actually fell from, from 1991 to 2018. So that's very hopeful, um, a decline of 31%. And so much of it is because of reductions, that awareness and smoking prevention, improvement in early detection and treatment, all that screening that all of us try to promote. Um, that's really helping. That's really doing a good thing um, and, and impacting the stats. Um, so those long-term declines in mortality for the four leading cancers have halted. So that's for prostate, that's for breast, that's for colon, um, but there's still some accelerations for lung cancer. But um, there are now treatments for lung cancer, such as lift targeted therapies, where we're seeing um, a prognosis and, and survival um, change as well. Um, that five-year survival rates for all cancers diagnosed from, in, from 2010 to 2016 um, is 60% um, in white individuals, 63% in black individuals. And the rates for COVID-19 and cancer remain unknown. I'm sure many of you are asking that. The data is still very much in its infancy and very preliminary, but it tells us that, of course, cancer patients are at the highest risk, right, because they're immunocompromised. Um, and that, that it likely isn't any different, but because of their immunocompromised state, they're very similar to those folks that have comorbid conditions like heart disease and diabetes, <clears throat> excuse me, and that. But recognizing that folks with lung and um, hematologic cancers like leukemia, um, and especially that went tr underwent treatment within that kind of past month when COVID was at, at the height, was most at risk for um, sadly mortality. And 
medical costs. Cancer is an expensive disease. I'm sure many of you have heard this from your patients. Um, it's it's um, very expensive and the projections for 2020 was to be one, um, $174 billion. Um, what are the behavioral risk factors? Many of you are familiar with it. I'm not gonna try, uh, board in you too much with this, but of course, tobacco, the smoking, the chewing, any of, of that can um, give us, uh, uh, produce head and neck cancers, um, stomach cancers, pancreas cancers, um, uh, alcohol, 75% of the oral cancers, diet and obesity, you know, really important. Um, it's about a third of cancer deaths, right? It's poor diet and exercise and, and nutrition and, and vitamin sun exposure, the, um, you know, melanoma, right? Um, it's that outdoor and the indoor, the UVA tanning. Socioeconomic status, that seems to be a risk factor as well. You're less likely to access treatment or have access to medical treatment as a result. Um, sexual behaviors, the oral and anal cancers, HPV, hepatitis B and C, H. pylori. Um, gender, still females overall, specifically um, more common breast and prostate. Uh, um, and the age tends to be older age. 78% of cancer diagnoses are those that are 55 years and older. Um, but also recognizing the fact that young adults, the 18 to 40 year olds, there is an increase, especially for example, in GI cancer. Family history plays a role. We know that genetics play, plays a role. Environmental factors plays a role. So when we get our patients saying, gosh, why me? Why this? You know, that it's, there's never really a good answer to that question because it is multifactorial. Um, and just recognize that almost 800,000 um, cases will be in 2021 that are potentially avoidable. So burden you with all those stats. So Clearly, this brings distress. We've seen the mental health statistics. We've seen what, what happens in cancer. So certainly distress in, in um, the field of psycho-oncology or, or what's called psychosocial oncology is really a subspecialty to address this, right? So while patients are receiving their active treatment or when they're even in survivorship or end of life, um, having access to mental health professionals that are concerned with treating that be social and psychological and emotional. You know, so much of that is part of the treatment process, part of the grief process, part of the healing process. Um, so from prevention to survivorship to terminal disease through bereavement, we're there. We're there to help the cancer patient and the family. Um, the impact of cancer on the psychological functioning of, of the patients and the caregivers and the, and the staff is so vitally important. Um, the behavioral factors um, in coping and survival. So we're called psycho-oncologists. And these are just, you know, psychiatrists um, that are, are trained with, with working with patients and family members with cancer and staff, psychologists such as myself and social workers. And there's a lot of discipline through clinical work, teaching, research, activism, and professional networking. And there's lots of pioneers. So just, you might be asking, gosh, how, when did this kind of start? So we back when in 1950s, um, Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. Weissman, he was a psychoanalyst. Um, and he was the first one to write a book, Coping with Cancer, that really talked about that the trainee has to understand what the cancer patient is going through from a mental health perspective, using a multidisciplinary approach that it really has to be um, incorporated in this kind of holistic cancer care. So way back when in 1950s, and it wasn't until the 1970s, um, and that picture there is of uh, 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 Dr. Jimmy Holland, who was our mentor and myself at, at ASCO um, a few years back. She has since passed, but she was really our icon, our pioneer. Her husband, James Holland, was an oncologist coming home to talk to her about the distress that his uh, patients were experiencing when it came to quality of life aspects. And she said, you know, James, you, we, you really have to deal with, with the, the distress that these patients are going through, you, you know, can't be ignored. And believe it or not, she started the field. So she, it literally was a card table and an index card system. Um, my mentor at Northwestern, Dave uh, Sella, was one of her first fellows. And that's all it was. That's how it started that service, which now has plethora throughout the United States and worldwide, even in um, there's a global um, focus in Africa and many of, of uh, other underserved countries um, that um, psycho-oncology is, is a field of importance. So clearly there's a need for strategies. Clearly there's a need um, to address 
um, cancer treatment. And so, you know, we start there at diagnosis and staging, but as you'll see, it can go all throughout that where psycho-oncology is truly. And this was the um, Institute of Medicine report in 2005 that we really need to do something about patient distress. Because usually any kind of descriptive studies about psychology, what happens to the patient was after the treatment was done. And that is just completely light. So fortunately, advocates, um, both mental health as well as oncology, um, Dr. Patty Gans, who was a, a huge survivorship expert uh, down at UCLA, said, we got to do more. We got to start at the time of diagnosis. It can't just be when treatment ends or when patient is dying. So to recognize distress, um, uh, uh, all these experts, multidisciplinary experts came together and actually described what distress is. Because a lot of folks will say, well, what is distress? You know, is it just depression and anxiety? It's, it's completely more than that. So you'll see this very wordy um, definition, but it is a multifaceted and pleasant emotional experience of psychological. So it's that cognitive aspect, the behavioral aspect, the emotional aspect, the social, the spiritual, which interferes with that ability to cope effectively with cancer, the physical symptoms, the treatment, it, and it really extends across a continuum where there are common normal feelings of vulnerability and sadness and fears to problems that can become very disabling, such as depression, anxiety, panic, social isolation, and an existential and spiritual crisis. Um, we know that elevated risk of distress does exist among adult cancer patients, and their prevalence very much varies by type of cancer. So way back when, in the early 2000s, one of the largest studies that looked at, at different types of cancer and distress in a sample of over 4,400 cancer patients, um, the prevalence rate was 35%, which varied anywhere from like 29 for uh, gynecological cancers for, to 43% for lung cancer. In those recent reports that rates can be as high as 60%, again, it very much depends on the site, on the stage, where that, that patient is at um, and why. Why does this distress happen? It's because of these periods of vulnerability, right? At time of diagnosis, even prior to that, when their patients are just waiting for, for their scans, for their blood tests to tell them if that they have a cancer diagnosis, all the way um, to the end of life that can interfere with their ability to perform daily tasks. So when folks say, or colleagues tell me, gosh, you know, distress is just having a bad day. No, it is not. It is truly a continuum of symptoms that range from anywhere from feelings of sadness to those that can be very debilitating, panic, warrant, or warranting um, psychosocial intervention and treatment. We know that physicians versus staff, so, substantially underestimate um, the patient's psychosocial distress. The, lots of research has been done for many, many years. But it's also that the patients typically only disclose 50% of their emotional concerns to their providers. Why is that? They think that many reasons exist, but so many times patients tell us, I just think that the oncologist or the nurse or the staff does not have time to listen to that part of their, their treatment. And it very much is. Um, patients are willing to discuss distress only if the physician or that staff member initiates it. Um, but the patients tend to try to defer to patients to raise concerns. Um, so, you know, we try to even teach our fellows. It's such an, a, a critical piece always to address, you know, emotional concerns that exist. Um, often patients provide indirect clues about their concerns. I'm just not sure what there is to look forward to in their discussions with you. So, you know, recognizing that's a red flag and to always be able to, to offer that we do have services um, that can help, that they're not alone, that certainly the team is, is on their side. Um, so, you know, patients are at an increased risk of vulnerability. That, that, that makes sense. That's part of the guidelines. And the sign and symptoms of anywhere from normal fear or worry to the future of uncertainty. uncertainty. So clearly you can see its concerns regarding illness and its sadness and its anger. You know, this new sense of normalcy, poor sleep, um, this poor appetite, uh, concentration, preoccupation with the thoughts of illness or death. You know, cancer has changed certainly over the years, but in talking to patients, I'm sure that you all recognize for many, they still view it as a death sentence. It, there's still a stigma associated with cancer and those disease or treatment or side effects. 
So recognizing there's um, patients that are increased risk of distress, those that have prior psychiatric illnesses, substance abuse, depression, past suicidal attempt, those with some cognitive impairment. Um, you may have heard of chemo brain. That's something that we study that I'll talk to you a bit about. Communication barriers, comorbid, some social problems within the family, within friends, within network that can include financial distress as well, recognizing that. Um, spiritual and religious concerns and also uncontrolled symptoms. And those periods of vulnerability, we already talked about that, but it's that suspicious sus uh, symptom that you might be experiencing that during that workup, you know, waiting for those, those scans and tests um, for treatment, um, you know, treatment more modality. Did my treatment work? Um, the end of treatment, the discharge from the hospital, the stressors of survivorship, you know, just one page um, treatment ends. It doesn't necessarily mean that the distress ends. Um, survivors will tell you that it's a new normalcy that they just don't know how to adjust to. And medical follow-up treatment failure, all of that, advanced cancer and end of life, as you see there. So in 2009, uh, the International Psycho-Oncology Society said that we have to, we have to raise awareness. Distress is just as important as um, uh, you know, a temperature increase, um, as rashes, as infections, as any any kind of comorbid symptom that the cancer patient may experience from treatment, distress is just that important. And they decided to revise the clinical um, standards that it has to be ranked as a vital sign. So American College of Surgeons um, in 2021 requires, and it was actually in 2015 that they implemented it, that every cancer uh, center or every cancer um, uh, community site also requires that clinicians um, evaluate patients for emotional distress. You always have to ask, you have to, you know, use tools in that and refer them to um, services. But recognizing that there's limited understanding to the effects of distress, right? Clinicians will say, gosh, I just don't have time to deal with, deal with this, you know, and that, that there should be these preliminary screens, but that preliminary screen really just be used so that you can refer patients to the appropriate you know, psychosocial support team, okay? Um, this is just an, a really quick example. Maybe you'll see it in the clinic, depending on studies that you're all working on, or maybe even um, some clinics do use this as a screen. But um, Dr. Holland um, had devised, and her team had devised this thermometer, you know, during the past week, how distressed have you been? Um, zero to 10, zero being no distress and 10 being extreme distress. And remember, recognizing it's not just anxiety and depression. Certainly it could be that, but it's more practical problems like insurance and transportation and family problems and emotional problems and the physical problems, right? Um, so it's a kind of a nice checklist. And we encourage sites, especially in the community when they're really busy, um, to at least attempt to use that so that it initiates a dialogue between the clinician and the, and the patient. Certainly there are more um, validated and, and quantitative measures out there, but this is was something you know designed that that the clinician doesn't have to be fearful of to use it. What's the consequence of the stress? You might ask. Certainly, it impairs quality of life. It decreases the employment employment functioning. It's really hard to get through the day. Um, for example, the fatigue that patients experience. It's worse than having the flu. That you just can't pick up. It takes all that they can to get going. Um, decreased adherence, medical costs, uh, health risks and behaviors, and decreased um, health protective behaviors, right? Um, you know, diet and maybe going back to smoking and, and other things. Um, symptom prevalence, so, you know, fatigue, it is a devastating symptom. Um, exhausting. It's like having the worst flu that you could ever have, but it's almost beyond that because it's very difficult to get out of bed. And this was probably one of the early studies in 1998, but I can tell you now in 2021, in all the studies that we do, fatigue, more than pain, tends to be the top symptom of complaint that patients present to us. Then pain, then anxiety, then sadness, then nausea. So it hasn't changed in the over 20 years that it was first described. So we ask, you know, what, what are patients really experiencing when it comes to distress? Um, the research shows anywhere from 30 to 50 percent experience some kind of psychological comorbidity across the cancer trajectory, um, again, depending on, on um, disease and site. 
And anxiety, we know that adjustment disorders are very common, panic disorders, agoraphobia, PTSD, GAD. Again, it really depends so much on the patient's history. Um, one of the studies uh, very early on, 15% of breast cancer patients exhibited symptoms related to PTSD simply due to the potential trauma of the, the info being told of biopsy and, and what, you know, what they have to endure treatment-wise. That resulted in some passive coping and, and um, has potential relationships with, with, with survival. Depression, anywhere from 26% uh, met DSM-5 for criteria now we're in DSM-5 for major depressive disorder. Um, and that's three times greater than um, advanced cancer patients who don't really acknowledge their prognosis. So folks that are in denial, um, their mood is worsened overall. And that can be associated with stage and impairment. Quality of life um, is definitely a significant treatment and clinical trial endpoint. Um, it's associated also with coping and survival. Suicidal ideation, very important, especially at the end of life. Um, the rate of suicide is twice of that of, of the general population. Increased risk in certain advanced stages, especially pancreas cancer um, is one example, but it, it's a correct. Uh, cancers across the board. Hopelessness it contributes to this um, prediction of suicidal ideation. In passive suicidal ideation, um, there's a lot of death anxiety, what's called death wishes that, that's described in the literature. And delirium, these kind of altered states of consciousness due to cancer treatment or effects. And again, we talked about chemo brain or chemo bug, which, you know, we it's not completely due to the uh, um, chemotherapy, we do know that it's responsible, but this is a study that um, I uh, did a, a few years back looking at patients that um, advanced cancer patients that go on phase one trials with, with um, wonderful experts and mentors. And what we found is that um, certainly uh, chemo brain does exist, and these are advanced cancer patients that come in, but we know that it can exi exist because of stress, of pain, of the past treatments that they've been on, also, um, as a result of fluctuations in your, the cytokines, we know colon cancer patients have uh, fluctuation in, in kind of in, in cytokines. Hormonal imbalances can result in, in cognitive issues. So just recognizing this, and I'm not going to go too much into it, but that the, out of 118 patients that we interviewed, we gave them a bunch of cognitive tests, 50% who couldn't remember what the purpose of their phase one trial was, why they were kind of going into it, that it was really to determine drug toxicity. Um, it, they had issues with attention and visual attention and executive functioning. And clearly the older they got, it, um, it, there was concern there. Um, so just to tell tells you that in the research that we do at the UFC, that we're always researching a lot of these aspects and that, for example, cognitive function really seems to play a role in, in, in patients' recall and comprehension of what they're told by their doctor. So COVID and cancer, I'm sure that many of you um, are, are curious about this and you've gone through so many lectures, I'm sure, but the cancer experience, certainly it's a period of adjustment and new form of normalcy and know that you are all directly part of this, hearing it from your patients. That can range anywhere from sadness and depression and loneliness and a lot of grief and anxiety and fear. Um, and it's due to that COVID-19 that life is of course completely different due to the immunocompromised state, the risk of infection that we talked about, the change in visit to the doc doctor or the staff, right? It's all telemedicine. We're spending so much time on, on the phone, on telemedicine visits and um, that change in cancer treatment as well. Um, so that pandemic stress, that pandemic loneliness, we know COVID-19, there's a lot of uh, related depression and social isolation in the general population. The, again, the statistics for cancer is very preliminary right now, but we do know that at least anecdotally patients are telling us there's a lot of, a lot of grief um, because of a loss of job, a loss of status, a loss of a loved one or family that maybe the cancer patient is experiencing themselves, their loved one died, their change in relationships, their physical status. Um, and you might ask, so we did one study with Dr. Lee um, looking at ovarian cancer patients. And we um, interviewed some ovarian cancer patients at our institution. Um, again, gave them an interview with, with multiple measures that you see there. And um, out of 61 of, of 104 that we broached, and this was really early on in the pandemic, so March 15, 
15th, 17th, we were on lockdown. We started about two weeks later. So it was very early. But we found out that patients were experiencing loneliness already during that pandemic, during that early, early phase of the pandemic, right? So it was in 43% of the participants that we interviewed. Um, the screens for depression and anxiety at, the, at that time um, wasn't found to be uh, severe, but we did find that quality of life was very similar um, to, to the original kind of instrument validation, meaning that it was, was relatively low, but there was high resilience with only 10% reporting um, low resilience. So though, although patients seemed that they were coping, what was glaring there was that loneliness, that loneliness was very profound among can uh, ovarian cancer patients during this early part of the pandemic. And recognizing the fact they couldn't do go to their social support, you know, the advocacy groups that they go to, the wellness house visits, just seeing even the cancer team um, like impacted that. So recognizing that um, distress doesn't just impact our, our patients, certainly it impacts um, the caregiver and extensive research has examined their needs during the trajectory. Um, one really robust study showed that 38% of cancer uh, caregivers report symptoms that re related to this DSM-4 criteria. Again, we're in DSM-5, but for, um, uh, for an actual psychiatric diagnosis of depression or anxiety. You might ask why or why not? And it's because they aid the patient in decision-making regarding treatment. How many times we've asked our patients questions, they'll say, ah, it's all, ask my wife, my wife knows better. And it's because they've had to take on this responsibility. And at the end of life, especially becomes the proxy um, decision-maker. That adjustment, lots of family, lots of occupational changes, um, having to take part-time jobs, um, you, you know, and that, and um, potentially uh, if, if the a patient was the, the breadwinner in the family. Um, financial burdens and that lack of social support is great. Caregivers will tell you, I'm really appreciative of my neighbors bringing over casseroles, but it, sometimes it's not enough. I need that babysitter. I need these kind of, I need somebody to help take care of my husband while I go grocery shopping, even in, in the pandemic. Um, so quality of life is certainly just diminished. And they are found to access medical and mental health services more frequently than even caregivers of Alzheimer's patients. So that, that's an interesting find, finding. I'm, I'm certain that that will change over time, but just to recognize that the caregivers are going through a lot. So what are some of the interventions that, that we, we um, do that, that help patients? Um, it's psychosocial interventions, right? So just even giving patients that are in significant distress information on disease and process and treatment and coping and resources, right? That helps to reduce the anxiety and depression, especially in the newly diagnosed. And I actually think, you know, reminding patients across the trajectory, no matter where that at, hey, we have a supportive oncology program. Hey, we're the team, we're here. You know, talk to Dr. So-and-so, talk to nurse so-and-so. Um, that's it's really important. Um, and some of the cognitive behavioral interventions for anticipatory anxiety, that kind of anxiety that they start to feel um, when they're just driving in, into the hospital, when they're trying to get that line in and they can't get that line into the patient. Uh, we know like medical hypnosis is, is effective uh, and CVT works for pain and fatigue and insomnia. Problem solving therapy is another form biofeedback where, where we teach them relaxation and show them um, their vital signs, how that is changing when they're relaxed. Um, psychosocial interventions, group therapy, that's a really common um, um, modality, especially in survivorship supportive groups where you can share your cancer-related experiences, peer a support health, um, self-help informational support, internet-based support, especially now. Um, and I'll give you a lot of resources at the end, but the wellness houses, Gilda's, um, they do a lot of virtual support right now. They know the patients and caregivers need it. Um, and therapeutic processes, you know, that alliance that, that we build with our patient, doesn't matter if you're a doctor or a nurse, you know, a clinical coordinator, there is that kind of alliance that you build with the patient just by seeing them, by seeing their family, their rapport building, you know, and sharing in that empathy, such, such a powerful tool that we have. And um, complementary alternative approaches as well, yoga, Reiki, Tai Chi. Um, for caregivers, it's very much the same, the psychosocial, educational um, interventions, problem solving, CBT, and also cognitive behavioral therapy. What are the effects of these, you might ask? And these are some of the seminal um, studies that were, were done. 
but can it improve health? Because, you know, health outcomes, uh, survival, there's still lots of debate on that, but it just shows from two studies that there are positive effects of cycle, psychological interventions on survival, but they're not really able to be replicated. So you can't really say, oh, it improves survival, but there are correlations. It tends to be correlated sometimes with survival. You know, it's just maybe that the patient is able to better cope, at, you know, with their, with their treatment. Um, and that. So again, debate is out. You know, there's there's still a lot of um, debate and discussion in our realm whether whether this helps when it comes to survival. But it certainly helps in coping any of these these um, these type of interventions. So CBT, for example, helps with post-surgical breast cancer. It helps with cortisol, which is um, you know, related to stress and cytokines um, and health outcomes and side effects. Um, and that's found also for yoga and mindfulness studies. Um, and again, there's still debate on the health outcomes, but it's, it's always good as a coping mechanism. Communication, we know communication helps to reduce distress. Um, it helps to improve patients' understanding of their illness, their adherence to treatment, to avoid burnout um, and fulfillment. We'll talk about burnout, but really communication is the fundamental element of, I would say, the clinician. I mean, the old school ethics, it's, it's, the, it's the physician-patient relationship, but it's the nurse, it's the you know, clinical staff. Again, we build relationships. We're all part of that team. So it's, you know, so it's really important to be a good communicator as much as we can, especially in patient distress. And sometimes we're receiving that negative affect and that can be really uncomfortable. Um, but communication, we know that if you're trained in communication or you have some techniques between patients and, you know, oncologists, but it's really the team, it can be challenging but given all that, you know, biomedical information and decision making. So breaking bad news and procedures and treatment options and, and, and you know, transitions to uh, palliative or end of life care, that's really tough to deal with. Um, but we know it's a critical tool. Having communication skills is critical because it does help us when it comes to burnout, right? And many of you have probably heard of this, compassion fatigue and all. Our institution is doing a really great job as as well with a lot of support, but burnout is reflective of the practice health. You won't have a burnout clinician if, if the practice is thoughtful of their well-being. And I do a lot of work at ASCO and really have become an advocate for, for clinicians and for the oncology team that um, we have to recognize the well-being. And especially now after this COVID-19 pandemic, it's going to be for the long term that we have to think of our own well-being as clinicians as well. So burnout, it's an occupational related syndrome, recognize that. It's not, it's not the clinician's fault. It's not the team member's fault. It's a clinical syndrome that manifests as these occupational and interpersonal pressures um, you know, rise over time. And there's three, three dimensions, some people call them symptoms, but just really recognizing that it's that physical, emotional exhaustion, you know, barely trying to get into the building to you know, do, your, do the work. And recognizing the fact that, that it starts with the person that's trying to do such a good job, the hard worker that's spending long nights and hours at work at their computer, um, really when it comes to patient care and, and everything that they do. So it's the hard worker that's very much at risk of burnout. And there's 12 different stages that, that occur and that could be a totally different lecture in itself, but just recognizing some cynicism and depersonalization exists and a reduced sense of professional accomplishment that no matter what you do, no matter how successful you feel, it just doesn't feel like it's enough. And the World Health Organization expanded this definition to make sure that, it, that everyone understands it's an occupational related syndrome and it, tie, it ties this burnout to chronic workplace stress. Okay, so that impact of COVID-19 in oncology on patients, on clinicians, but the burden is, is certainly experienced by our systems. That disruption in cancer care, many of you have been witness to this, the treatment delays, um, the modified informed consent procedures, the complex treatment decision-making, um, you know, do we give the patient the IV versus the oral, um, that altered oncologist patient relationship in, in telemedicine, you know, with the team. Patients love, love that one-on-one -on -one contact, but we couldn't, we just couldn't do it, of course, because of COVID-19. The difficult communication regarding cancer care with patients and families, uh, what are the end of life wishes and values? Having to have discussions on DNR as a routine practice. Um, what are the cultural norms of the family um, when it comes to end of life care and advanced care planning? Really having to bring that up in front and center. Um, the allocations of resources, you know, do we have enough funds 
um, to provide, you know, is the cancer patient X, are they appropriate to be given a vent, so to speak? These were some of the decisions that were being, were being um, um, done in the midst of the pandemic and it's in the United States, but it's actually worldwide. We know that. So that clinician staff, that burnout, that moral distress and that psychological well being, it's because these patients are immunocompromised, um, significant stress, we're feeling more all distress because, you know, you know the right thing to do, but because of the constraints around us and because of the pandemic, because of the institutional, we just couldn't do um, and makes it difficult to fulfill that action that you wanted to. And, you know, we know from the SARS pandemic of the early 2000s that there are significant short-term and long-term mental health concerns and compassion fatigue that can arise as a result. Of, of these type of pandemic tools. So we, we created a communications program at the University of Chicago, uh, first for fellows, but now we've included, you know, APPs in that. If you ever want to be part of it, please let me know. I'm happy to keep you included, but it, it's great to talk about some of the, the, the tasks. But, you know, there's also this kind of mindful communication that can work for anybody when we're interacting with patients, right? And it's my good colleague and friend at Rochester, Dr. Um, Epstein, that that talks about entering any clinical encounter and even in the telemedicine encounter with a focus on the relationship at hand. is It's it's the patient and it's you, it's the oncologist, it's the nurse, it's the staff and engaging in the five senses, right? So having four requirements, that observation of the patient, of ourselves, what's the issue at hand? Is it even just a scheduling issue? What is the issue at hand that you need to communicate with? Because you're seeing multiple patients during the day. You know, it's really, it's really hard to to think about our own well-being. So really being observant can, can help that. And what's that cr critical curiosity? And that's that courage to see your own weakness in the situation, right? How can I maybe communicate better? Why is this uh, patient distress? Recognizing the stress isn't always about you, but asking that, that question of self to, to just receive that answer. Um, is really important. And observing with a fresh perspective without notions and tolerance of conviction, um, presence or distraction of attention to the patient and the task at hand. And writing narratives and stories to explore the questions with difficult patient encounters, that can really be helpful and very therapeutic and cathartic, very healing. Um, so enhancing well-being, what can we do? What, how can we encourage our patients? Certainly going to resources, certain going to the resources at our institution and outside in the community, cancer community support, but expressing feelings. We know fears, pride, joy, not to bottle it up um, to family for 15 minutes at a time, to maybe even um, you know, to the oncology team. Um, identifying negative thoughts that impact these emotions, right? What are the situations? Um, participating in pleasurable activities that really bring joy, taking time to enjoy the present moment, such as mindful moments. You know, we really don't enjoy that cup of coffee, just the warmth of the coffee, for example, or the warmth of that tea, or looking at a flower and looking at every detail of that flower, especially now during spring. Create a mantra for grounding and challenging emotions. I will be kind to myself. Maybe it's just the word calm home and repeating that over and over. Taking time to relax and engage in self-care, time off of work is normal, really take that day off. Um, exercise, read, watch movies, plan and prepare for the holidays. Um, for example, Memorial Day coming up, um, creating new traditions. Maybe it would be a virtual barbecue, even though you know, many places are opening up, there's still some restrictions across the country. So recognizing that or folks that are you know, far away and can't travel. Social support, asking for help. It's okay to say no. It's so tough to keep boundaries. I can tell you myself, I'm working a little longer, I think, during the pandemic than usual. But it's okay to say no. It's okay to set the limits um, and, and encourage and engage in physical activities. Um, there's lots of financial burdens that folks are experiencing, certainly because of loss of jobs and that, but um, also recognizing that, you, that there are limitations and enhancing knowledge about COVID-19 restrictions in the area. That's really important as well well and that can help to prepare you but it's important to meditate um it's you know is it about sitting still is it about being a re relaxing it's not just the process you simply surrender it's just a beautiful place to be and you pay nothing pay no attention to nothing in particular just simply being awake allowing the happiness to bubble up and mindfulness um i'm a little biased uh, i trained in mindfulness for years and years since I was a resident at the VA, but it's a, a, it's a wonderful tool to simply bring that awareness and ability to pay attention in a particular way in purpose 
in the present moment and non-judgmental. Like out of all the modalities that, that we've taught to either patients or caregivers or families, mindfulness is something that always folks will try um, no matter what. It, and it's just very easy to, to be mindful in the moment. It does take time, but it, it, it can be. And what is the core? Um, the core technique is breath, breath work. It's breathing in through your mind and body. That's a daily exercise. How many times we forget to breathe, especially when we're stressed. So why don't we sit comfortably for just a one minute breathing exercise. Close your eyes with your spine reasonably straight and direct your attention to your breathing. When the thoughts, the emotions, physical, environment and sounds occur. Simply accept them, giving them the space to come and go without judgment or being involved with them. When you notice your attention has drifted off and you become aware of these thoughts or feelings, Simply note them. Note that your attention has drifted and bring your attention back to your breathing. Recognizing it's okay and natural for the thoughts to arise and that your attention will follow them. No matter how many times this happens, simply keep breathing and bring your attention back to your breathing. When you are ready, you may open your eyes and acclimate to your environment once again to this virtual environment. So again, oops. Um, that's what I want to do. Okay, so that's how easy it can be. So walking, mindful walking is really important. Next time you're feeling overwhelmed, press your feet against the floor to feel, engage that body, to engage the five, sen five senses. Become inquisitive. If, if you ever find yourself in that dispute um, with your colleague, your family, don't ever argue. Again, ask questions. No one can ever fault you for asking a question. And it's by being inquisitive we re we uncover roadblocks in naming the mood, externalizing emotions. I feel angry. I feel sad. You know, um, this really helps to put your feelings in perspective and, and gets it out. Um, you know, if you really want to practice this one every hour, right? One word summarizing your state of mind. But I would even just suggest morning, uh, lunch, and night. You'll see that at the days and in reviewing your list, you'll see that the worst feelings uh, don't last, that they do pass. And letting it go. This is a visualization exercise before leaving the hospital, going to sleep. Imagine a box and that you place the day's events, good or bad inside, and visualize it um, floating away. Um, what are three things that went well today? This is a great action um, to help foster resilience. So before going to sleep, to, to try to do some type of relaxing exercise, taking maybe a warm bath, things like that. Um, you know, what are three things that went well today? Um, and daily gratitude. Gratitude is certainly a new modality that a lot of new research is, is coming up with. But recognizing that expressing emotions, things like empathy, compassion, and gratitude um, can bring significant um, healing and peace. And asking oneself, what are three things that you're most grateful for and why? So I'm grateful for being here with all of you. I'm grateful for the sun and I'm grateful for my health because that all brings healing and peace to me. Um, so recognizing again, you are not alone. 
um, distress management. Always, if you have a patient that needs help, you can always call our American Society for Oncology for helpline. There are actually therapists there. But recognizing internally, we have consultation with palliative care, Dr. Mallett's physical, uh, physical therapy services as well. And again, any of the cancer support organizations, um, again, lots of telephone-based counseling can occur as well as the virtual. And um, oops, patient navigation, here is all our support. Uh, Immerman's Angels, if you're looking for peer support, they're great, um, great society. And again, um, you could, it could be self-referral. You don't need an MD referral to do any of the cancer support um, system uh, sites and that like Gilda's. I actually do quite a bit of work with Gilda, so they're, they're wonderful, but so is Wellness House. Any of any, anything that you can um, refer your patients to, really important. Um, and that, and then of course, here are some resources, um, some apps that are helpful for even us as well as our patients. Um, again, Perspectives is available within the University of Chicago. Kathy Blaskovitz and her team is just fantastic if you need help. And um, this is um, Vital Talk, which is a communication app. Um, my colleague Tony Bach created this, and it's a free app through iTunes or um, the, the Android system. So you can always, there it is, tips.vitaltalk.org if you're learning more about empathy and communication with patients, although it seems like it's more for clinicians, I think any of us can learn um, you know, how to talk, talk to patients. So thanks. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be with you. Wow, Dr. Lubaki, that was so much great information. That was really a great presentation. You covered so many different aspects of, of mental health across the, wow, the cancer care continuum from patients to caregivers to, to providers um, and so many great resources. Thank you so, so much for all of that. That was wonderful. Uh, it's my um, privilege. Sorry if so, you need to uh, have a headache afterwards, but. <laughs> oh, no, no, this, this was great. This was really, really great. Thank you again. Um, in the interest of time, we did have one question here um, asking about our physicians regularly using the screening tool. And I'm, I, I guess you could probably speak more to the physicians at the University of Chicago. Uh, yeah, well, I actually, and I, I trained and worked at other places as well. They do, they should be using it. I have witnessed, you know, sometimes trainees actually, you know, for, foregoing the screen and really encouraging that this is a very important part of, of that, you know, that, that interview, that, that relationship, if anything. And I think why, the, the question is always, why do they not use it? And I think a lot of clinicians can be fearful, right? And especially sometimes the trainees tell us they're fearful because gosh, that's gonna take extra time. No, actually the research shows if you address, I see you're feeling distress, I feel like I see you're feeling sad, naming an emotion um, in that, not angry, but maybe you're, I see you uh, feeling frustrated. It actually saves on the clinic time right? It saves on that clinic time because you're, you're addressing it versus it being extended and then it being built up that it becomes more distressful towards the end. So yes, um, at our institution, we um, have used the PHQ4. I think that's going to be revised shortly, um, but a very brief screen. You saw the thermometer there, especially in the community practices. Um, we, we do encourage it. And again, it's not that that's a diagnostic, but that that be a screen so that the clinician um, can um, then refer to, to the team for any kind of, and even if it's minimal distress, you know, um, we, we should address any, any concerns that the patients have. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing that. Um, we've got a lot of, um, uh, a lot of comments here. So someone said, thank you for the breathing exercise. I agree, it's always great to recenter. Um, Tosin, our partner from Sisters Working It Out, um, she said they have an, uh, is another great resource for support and she's added the, um, the website there. And we will, um, what we're gonna do, uh, so Dr. Hubaki has shared her PowerPoint with me. Um, and so uh, for all of you who are joining us on Zoom, I am going to um, make sure that in the follow-up email, you have access to that and all those great resources. Um, we had another um, comment from someone on our Facebook Live just saying, you know, that these are great resources as well. So what I'll do is also just share, um, you know, just copy and paste some of those resources and, and share them um, on our social media as well, just to, again, get the word out about all the, the great information that you've, you've given us today. And this is been wonderful. Um, so thank you again to Dr. Hubaki. This was uh, a really great and informative session, and we're so appreciative of your time today.
Oh, thank you. It's my honor and pleasure. I hope I hope it wasn't too overwhelming. But again, you have all the resources there for you. And um, I hope you'll you'll use it again in the future. And I'm so privileged to be with all of you today. And I'm sending you good wishes. And um, thank you again. Okay, everyone.